Good morning. I'm John Rifle, and I serve as the Interim Dean for Sigma College of Business, and it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to this uh, Peter F. Secchia breakfast. Um, Ambassador Secchia, uh, unfortunately, is not able to be with us here this morning, but I certainly do want to acknowledge and thank him uh, for all the financial support he provides uh, for these wonderful breakfasts. So thank you, uh, Ambassador Secchia. Um, I would also like to acknowledge a very special guest here this morning. President Thomas Haas has taken time out of his busy schedule to join us here. So President Haas, uh, take a bow, please. <laughs> Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Bill Smith, who's the president of the Seidman Alumni Association. And uh, Bill will introduce our uh, breakfast speaker here this morning. Bill. Thank you, Dean. I have a hobby, and it relates to today's speaker. And in fact, uh, I brought part of my hobby with me today. And I collect coffee mugs from companies that didn't change, that went out of business. And so we have some small ones, little company like Pan Am. When I was first in business, I was in London in 1991 on Pan Am when they announced that they went out of business and we were standing in London going, that's impossible, Pan Am is too big, and yet I'm standing there with a ticket that was worthless. <laughs> Pan Am didn't change. In the food business, Brandon, there's Bill Knapps. My parents love Bill Knapps. <laughs> in fact, this is my dad's Bill Knapp's 40th anniversary coffee mug. This was, you know, a real pride. Big behemoth, General Motors. Pontiac manufacturing operations. What happened to Pontiac? They didn't change. So this morning's speaker, Brandon Solano, is vice president of franchise development and he knows about change. And we'll get back to that in a second, Brandon. Because first, Brandon is a Laker. He graduated from Grand Valley. Somewhere along the way, he ended up in Notre Dame for his MBA with some other Grand Valley people you might know. Um, and second, he's from Michigan. And interestingly, uh, after Brandon graduated, he was sharing with me that he started working in Grand Rapids at an agency and things didn't uh, work out there. The agency lost a big account. And he ended up on the East Coast and he did some P&G things and he did some Kellogg's things. But the thing that really confuses me is he got a job in marketing at Hershey with Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Now why anybody would leave a job <laughs> doing peanut butter cups and coming back to Michigan to do pizza? That's a big question. Not only did he come back to do pizza, but he came back to do pizza where people in focus groups were saying it tastes like cardboard and this stuff is awful. Well, Brandon has been recognized as a talented marketer because of what's happened. And uh, I'm uh, told by YouTube that he's really chef Brandon Solano at times. Uh, he's been named Advertising Age's Marketing 50. He's twice been awarded Domino's Top Team Honor in the Circle of Excellence Repi Award. I had to look up Repi. I thought it was a misspelling. Repi stands for Recognizing Team Members That Consistently Go Above and Beyond. He didn't just do his job. He looked at it and said, what can we do more? He's also received Innovator Award in 2008, Person of the Year in 2009 from Domino's largest franchise, RPM Pizza. So back to that change question. So by taste, Domino's was last, tied with Chunky Cheese. Those of you who have kids, there's only one reason to go to Chunky Cheese. It's not for the pizza. In November of 2008, I looked it up, and the stock price was $2.83. So for those business people here today, that's pretty substantial. Well, what is it today? Over 50. 
he had to listen to customers that said, it doesn't feel like there's much love in Domino's Pizza. So I really thought that Domino's was bound for my mug collection. But now I look at it in the last five years and what has happened and the change that's occurred is phenomenal. So Solano joined the Domino's team as that change agent, gutsy enough to work with the team and make it happen. And like I said, that stock price is uh, up over 50 now. So Brandon, would you join me and tell us this change story and uh, tell the Lakers what a smart risk Domino's turnaround is all about? Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. President Haas, thanks everyone for coming out. I know you have a choice of where you could be this morning. I appreciate it that you're here uh, with me. Um, leaving Hershey, you know, leaving, I was marketing director for Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. I will tell you this, when I told the kids we're leaving Hershey, the sweetest place on earth, they started to cry, <laughs> I swear. So uh, I left Hershey, Hershey's a great organization, a great company. I left because I saw the opportunity for change in Domino's. Um, you know, I thought that uh, the pizza could be much, much better. Uh, I thought there was real opportunity to make a difference at Domino's. And when I showed up uh, in Ann Arbor and interviewed with the management team, uh, I knew that they were the people who were willing to do whatever it uh, takes to win. At the time, our CEO was Dave Brandon. He's now uh, athletic director at the University of Michigan. Um, Dave was CEO of two companies in Michigan for over 20 years. Um, you know, Patrick Doyle was the president at the time, now our CEO. Uh, if you have an opportunity to work for folks like that, you have to take it. Um, and that's what I decided to do. So uh, I'm thrilled to be back at Grand Valley. I got my start here. Uh, I'm thrilled to see so many people that I know. Uh, I had a chance to talk to Bart for a little bit, uh, but, and Bart was here when I was a student, um, and I got to know Bart when my grades weren't quite where they were supposed to be. Uh, Bart called me in and we had a discussion about that. So Bart, thanks for uh, scaring me straight, putting me on the straight and narrow for sure. Um, I'd like to recognize a couple of students. This is obviously an uh, institution of higher learning. Um, Andrea Filter, I saw Andrea for about two seconds. Where are you? And this is Andrea Filter. Andrea has uh, chosen to join Domino's Leadership Development Program. Um, she's going to be joining us in Ann Arbor. We're thrilled to have you. Jack Ayat, where's Jack? Jack's president of the Student Senate. He's in the back. He doesn't know it yet, but uh, we're going to hire Jack and uh, drag him back to Ann Arbor as well. Um, we need leaders. We need winners. You guys are winners, and you guys are going to help us uh, take this company to absolutely the, uh, the next place. So at Grand Valley, very briefly, uh, I you know, graduated in 94, which is forever ago for uh, a lot of you. Um, I had an awful lot of leadership uh, opportunities here. Uh, I founded the Latino Student Union. I worked for Andy Beach now for two years in housing, um, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be the president of uh, Delta Sigma Phi, uh, the fraternity of engineered leadership. So learned an awful lot here. This, uh, this, organ this institution is really the foundation uh, of all that, uh, you know, that I was able to do uh, while working at Domino. So you got the background, all the places that I was. Little chuckle on, hey, you know, the head chef. By the way, I didn't tell my mom I was going to be on TV. <laughs> I didn't tell her. She called me up. I saw you on TV. What's going on? And they said, you're a chef. What's the deal? Um, I, thought, I thought you were in marketing, she said. Um, I ran uh, marketing for a company called Calphalon High-End Cookware. I opened the Calphalon Culinary Center in Chicago, teaching people how to cook. People don't know how to cook anymore. So I was in the cookware business. That's really, really bad. Okay, people know how to cook, so here's how you use your $500 set of cookware. So I cook with a lot of celebrity chefs. I've been you know, a foodie and a culinary guy forever. I am not you know, classically trained. Um, and by the way, right now, the fact that people don't know how to cook is really, really good for Domino's business. <laughs> Key messages. Uh, one of the things we need to do in your business, this is kind of the theme today, is identify self-limiting myths. What's a self-limiting myth? Oh, you know, I can only do this. It's self-imposed limits, okay? You do this in your personal life. People do this in business. The Domino's one was, we can't beat Pizza Hut and Papa John's in pizza taste. We'll beat them in speed, we'll beat them in service. They're always gonna be better than we are. Why? Because we decided, we weren't trying. We said, oh, we'll let them have that. We're in the food business, taste matters. Find the self-limiting myths in your own business and destroy them. Listen to the critics, but not all of them, okay? Our critics, our customers, they were telling us our pizza wasn't good enough, we had to listen to them. We also listened to some people when we did this transition and they said, we were fools. You guys are idiots. You're going to go out of business. You're insulting your current customers by telling them that the old pizza wasn't good enough. Don't listen to all of them, but listen to some of them. Seek high, risk, high return risks. Okay? 
So we're not gambling. We're not just taking risk for risk's sake. We're going to find the smart risks that have the biggest payout. Find those. Don't avoid all risks. Any CFOs in the in the you know any, any CFOs in here? Those guys. Okay, there we got one. Take some risk. Okay, some risk is good. The right ones, high return risk, not low return risk. Manage that risk with analysis, with research. Okay, we're not gambling. We're betting. We're we're counting cards. We're playing with uh, an advantage. Get active management support. Not the CEO that says, ah, uh, okay, I guess we'll do that. Okay, Patrick Doyle was president of Domino's when all of this was going on, and he wasn't supportive. Like, yeah, I guess we'll do that project. I dragged him to meetings. Okay, I had a team meeting. I called team maybe 15 people on this team to reinvent our new pizza. You know, you get 10 to show up, and somebody's arguing, and somebody doesn't want to do it. People don't like it, and then I say, Patrick's coming to the meeting. Guess what? 15 people show up. They're all in a good mood, and they want to help. Okay, get active management support. Be willing to sacrifice who you are for who you could become. So set the context. I joined Domino's right here, and I called my old boss at, uh, at Hershey, and I said, man, I never managed in a recession like this. What's your advice? And he said, don't get fired. <laughs> Consumers were unhappy. Their wallets were empty. Our business was cratering, and we were trying to figure out what's going on, looking at all the data. Where's this economy going? Where's it going? We knew where it was going, straight into the tank. Okay, 2008, disaster. Okay, it was a disaster. And we're a small business. Okay, we have nearly 1,000 franchisees in the U.S. They were suffering. They were hurting. And, you know, we're talking about our stock price. You know what? This is what matters to me most. You know, the franchisees who have chosen to invest in Domino's Pizza were not being successful, and we weren't helping them enough, and we needed to change that, and we knew that. So we knew we needed to change, but why did we do new and improved? Because we could have changed a lot of things. New deal. We could have had a new service. We could have had a new ad campaign. By the way, we tried most of those things, and we kept coming back to the same conclusion, which is, you know, we're great at service. Okay, here we go. We're number one. Okay, fabulous. We're tied with Chuck E. Cheese. Anybody been to Chuck E. Cheese? Got little kids? Pizza's not that great, okay? So some people think that this was preordained. Oh, look at Domino's. It worked, and you know, you got Conan O'Brien making fun of Patrick Doyle, and you know, it's great. It was going to work, and everybody in Ann Arbor was on board with it. Guess what? They weren't, okay? You can make a case for why this was the dumbest thing anybody ever did. 50-year-old recipe. We have almost 10,000, you know, stores all across the world. Who are you? This chocolate guy showed up, been here for a cup of coffee, been here for 10 minutes. You want to change the recipe? Come on, we're successful. We're, we're proud of this brand. We love this. And then you got all the data. Here's my data. Here's why. Or you could pull out an anecdote, an emotional argument. Guys, we're tied with Chuck E. Cheese. I know all that's true. Yeah, 5,000, you know, 9,000 stores, all that sort of thing. We are tied with Chuck E. Cheese and pizza taste. Argument's over. End of story. We've got to change. So we want to change it. I love this cartoon. Well, we tried everything else. I suppose we could try and improve the product. You can't hide from that today, you know? You can't. Consumers are changing. Social media, if you have a bad product, everybody knows it like that. So we spent almost two years working on our core pizza. That is a long time. Everybody remember this campaign? Got to be pretty old remember this one. We knew changing a core product was a huge risk. Okay, it's a huge risk. We had to do it right. The product was most important. Remember this? This is not your father's Oldsmobile. I hate picking on the big three. You know, we're in Michigan. I'd be better to do that somewhere else, but this is true. So, it's not your father's Oldsmobile. What'd they launch? Your mother's Oldsmobile. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have good product. You must have good product. So, what did we do? We invented the sauce, uh, reinvented the sauce, the crust, the cheese. We measure all this. You know, it sounds like, hey, there's a bunch of yahoos that, you know, and a couple pizza guys doing this. A lot of science went into this, an awful lot. Here are the nine stages of research. We spent over a million dollars in research. This one was one of my favorites, the experimental design. We had a variety of uh, crust options, a variety of sauce options, cheese options. Which one worked best with which option? We had an experimental design uh, where we tested 36 different combinations. The one, by the way, that myself and the chefs in the, in the kitchen tested that we said, this is our winner. This is the one we think is going to win. It, it actually won. And we didn't cook the books on the, the research, really, I promise. So what happened? Well, we went from last in taste to first, we beat uh, Pizza Hut and Papa John's in a competitive taste test. Anybody know Papa John's slogan? Better ingredients, better pizza. It's not true. It's not true. They were actually sued by Pizza Hut, and they said, well, it's not an actual marketing statement of fact. It's puffery, which is a legal defense, which says we're just kidding. It's an exaggerated claim. We don't really mean it. 
Um, and we beat them. So, you know, we went out and took a run at those guys, which is an awful lot of fun. Um, and this is where you destroy the self-limiting myth, okay? Oh, we'll never beat those guys in taste. We just did it. Now we gotta market it. Okay, you got the product. Now we have to market it. What are we gonna do? Anybody remember this? New Coke? Andrea Jack, for those of you under 40 in the room, let me explain. Okay, in about 1982, 83, Coke decided they were gonna reinvent their formula. New Coke goes down as probably the biggest marketing blunder ever, okay? And in a lot of ways, they were right. The new formula tasted better than their old formula. What they failed to recognize was, as a brand, Coke meant something. People were emotionally connected to Coca-Cola. It's my history, it's my heritage, you know, it's nostalgia. You can't change Coke, because then you change my history, you change my story, and so people rejected it. Um, and we knew that there's huge risk here, and we gotta do it right. So that's why, if you ever wonder, why does it say Coca-Cola Classic? It's because they had to differentiate. Oh, it's not the new one, it's the classic. I promise you'll never see Domino's Classic come back. <laughs> we needed a marketing idea. What are we gonna do? What's our idea? Now, we work with, with an agency called Crispin Porter Bogusky out, uh, out of Miami, and they are a really, really wacky bunch. So, uh, Jack, Andrea, we have drug testing. I wanna make sure you guys know that. Okay, we have drug testing at Domino's Pizza. Uh, be sure you can pass that. Um, we do not drug test the agency, okay? <laughs> We get pretty creative, I have to tell you. So, tensions. This is something that we talk about a lot when we're talking about marketing an idea. Um, and, and here's why we talk about this, and here's what I mean. Attention is attention in the lives of our customer. Okay, what's going on in the lives of our customer that make them tense? Culture. What's happening in the broader culture that creates tensions that is the context that we're gonna, marketing into, that we're gonna market into? Because you know what? You don't just market, oh, hey, you need pizza, here's a pizza. You're marketing to consumers in the context of their lives. What's going on? Your ad's on TV, the dog's barking, you know, the kid's writing on the wall with a crayon. You know, uh, what's going on? We have to recognize that it, you know, they're not just sitting around waiting for our message. There's bigger things happening in their lives, in culture, and importantly, with our brand. What are the tensions that exist with our brand? Um, when you can get these all three right, huge ad, huge win. So let's talk about it. The brand. Pulled this one off the internet. Domino's Pizza. We make our pizzas and our boxes out of the same material. <laughs> that was out there. You know, you think anybody in Ann Arbor didn't know that we had bad pizza? We thought it was good enough. Our consumers were telling us that it's not. Okay, how about our customers? What's going on in their lives? 2008, nine, we launched this in January 2010. Foreclosure, unemployment, people were worried. What was going on in the broader culture? Bear Stearns failed. Lehman failed. We had folks showing up in Washington asking for a bailout. Religious institutions failed. People became cynical. We don't trust companies. We don't trust our institutions anymore. You know, what's, what's you know, the, I don't think that the approval rating of Congress is any different now than it was then. Where they, you know, they're in the uh, mid-20s in terms of approval rating. We don't trust people anymore. We've become cynical, okay? So, knowing that that's the, that's the, those are the three tensions going on in consumers' lives. What could we do? We decided, you know what, we're gonna do something unexpected. We're gonna do something transparent. We're gonna listen, and we're gonna tell the truth. Now, your mom told you to tell the truth, right? Always tell the truth. And then somewhere along the, one, the way in business or you know, whatever it is that you do in your daily lives, you decided that telling the truth is the best policy most of the time, okay? But sometimes maybe we'll just, you know, not tell it quite, quite straight. And what we decided was we're just gonna go at it. Okay, we might be new coke, we might get fired. I, you know, there are a lot of us in marketing who said, you know, this doesn't go well, it's it, it's over. Our franchisees wanted us drug tested. You're gonna do what? You're gonna go out and say that our pizza's not good? So we're talking to our CMO that, you know, every idea we'd look at, uh, what do you think the franchisees are gonna say about that? And we had a scale between, like you'll get yelled at in a meeting, to brick through your window to like Molotov cocktail, right? This one was a Molotov cocktail idea. They're gonna burn your house down, Russell. Yeah, but it might work. Let's go check it out. So we listened to our critics and we put this ad together right here. Domino's pizza crust to me like cardboard. I hear what some folks are saying about our stuff. The sauce tastes like ketchup? Totally boy, a flavor. I mean, that hits you right in the heart. Most companies uh, hide the criticism that they're, they're getting and we actually faced it head on. 
this is what's driving us. This is what's making us want to get better. There comes a time when you know you've got to make a change. You've got to move forward. What's different about the new pizza? We improved everything. Sauce, crust, cheese, you name it, it's better. We had a much better taste in sauce. We put 40% more herbs in it. It's a bold flavor. More flavorful cheese. 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 Well, we put the garlic seasoning on the crust now. It, it's awesome. To be this honest, you have to have food to back it up. We're so proud of this pizza. We want everybody to try it. Deal is two medium, two topping pizzas for $5.99 each. If you don't like it, we'll give you your money back. All of it. Not half of it. All of it. <laughs> so I was in a TV ad. I will tell you this. And I try to tell the students that I talk to this. Being on TV is a very low standard of accomplishment for your life. <laughs> okay? It's not that big a deal. And you only have to look at the cast of the Jersey Shore to know I'm right. <laughs> this is the way we test ads. Okay? We test all of our ads, uh, quantitative testing. We test persuasion. We test awareness. Did somebody see my ad? Did it break through? Did they notice it? Were they persuaded by my ad? And you can see this is a company called Millward Brown. They're uh, you know, standard in the industry from packaged goods uh, to QSR where we operate. This is the QSR norm, quick serve restaurants. That's where we operate. That yellow area is a really good place to be. Where do you think that ad uh, tested? Anyone want to guess? Right there. It was the highest ad ever tested in 20 years across all categories. Home run. Home run ad. This is sales. We track sales, right? Here's how we're doing this week. This is in our store. This is a store in uh, Minneapolis. They had to write on the ceiling. We got all the way to the ceiling tiles because you know we absolutely blew up in terms of, uh, of our sales. This guy, Papa John's guy, stopped by. Wanted to try the new pizza. Hey. <laughs> we appreciate his business. Uh, we put up uh, a web page. Um, and again, this is 2010. The world's changed a lot since then. We were one of the first to let consumers post whatever they wanted. Used to be big companies would try to filter that. Oh, well, if somebody says something bad, I'm going to take it off. Guess what? We said if somebody says something bad, leave it up there. The thing that disappointed me is some people said, yeah, I haven't tried the new pizza, but I bet it still sucks. That really bummed me out. Um, and you know, we would try to get people to come back and, uh, and try it. But we let them say what they wanted to say. And that was fairly novel. So. You know, next thing we did is uh, we went to uh, some of our, our critics. We did a focus group. Um, we got in trouble with some researchers who didn't like that we you know, chased down people at their door who were in a focus group. Um, but we had uh, you know, them tell us what they thought, and then we followed up to see if they liked the change. We're here to see Carlos. Carlos was in a focus group, and he said some unflattering things about Domino's pizza. The crust is a little too rubbery. We're bringing in the new and improved pizza. Carlos. Low quality and forgettable. So, I didn't know you were listening. Domino's pizza, you start over. She has no idea what we're coming up. Major, yeah? Yeah. Uh -oh. Wait, if it's not good, tell me. I'm eating my words. Come back, I'm in. The critics have spoken. Now it's your turn. Try two medium, two topping, and buy your new pizzas for just $5.99 each. So what happened? Well, this is first quarter 2010. Um, you can see here's Pizza Hut. They were down in nine, they were up in 10. So we'll say, all right, you're on here. They're like plus two. Papa John's was flat. We were up 14%. We ran out of food. If you called us at this time, if we answered the phone, you know, we could sell you like a thin crust onion pizza because we were out of everything else. <laughs> Um, we estimate we lost a couple additional sales points because we just could not answer the phone, could not service the business. It was phenomenal. So um, this one is a really interesting one, and it really gets into the heart of marketing and food marketing and food photography, where we said, you know what, we're going to be honest. Beyond that, we're going to be transparent. We're going to show you what's going on behind the scenes. And nobody had ever done this, and we got a lot of heat from the industry for doing an ad like this. For years, food companies have been doing some pretty crazy things to make their food look good in ads. None of it does a thing to make pizza taste any better. So starting now, Domino's is changing the way we photograph our pizza. With pizza this good, you don't need all that nonsense. You just need sauce with a little zip, plenty of real cheese, and a garlic seasoned crust. In fact, we're so confident in our pizza, we want you to shoot our photos. Just order up two mediums and two toppings for $5.99 each and send us your shots. Domino's, what you see is what you get. That's no joke. On food shoots, you take the pizza and you screw down with screws the entire pizza except for one slice, and that's the slice that you pull out. And you put a lot of extra cheese on there, that's how it's done, um, and we don't do that. So we're, we're uh, you know, trying to improve the industry for sure. Um, we ask people to send in their pictures. Take a photo of your pizza, send it in. We put up this, uh, this web page, and guess what? People actually did send in their pizzas and their photos. 
you know, we're part of consumers' lives. You know, we're the solution when, you know, when you want to have uh, fun family pizza night. Um, you know, you name it. It, it really worked uh, well for us. And then we got some photos that we weren't very proud of. Because, you know, we've got 5,000 uh, stores in the United States. We deliver pizzas every day. Sometimes we don't get it right. And, you know, we acknowledge that. This is not acceptable. Bryce in Minnesota, you shouldn't have to get this from Domino's. We're better than this. When we launched showusforpizza.com, we asked our customers to be the photographers, and we've been thrilled by the results. But this, it really gets me upset. I'm Patrick Doyle, the CEO of this company. We're not going to fail. We aren't going to deliver pizzas like this. I guarantee it. So we're extending our $5.99 inspired pizza deal because we want to see even more of your pizza shots. We're still listening. We're going to learn. We're going to get better. So after that, we talked a little bit about transparency. We really wanted to show people where their ingredients come from. Provenance, where your food comes from, is becoming more and more important to consumers. And you know where they thought uh, our food came from? So we'd ask them, folks, hey, where do you think Domino's food comes from? I don't know. You know, a factory, a can, fell off the back of a Cisco truck. Like, they didn't understand where our food came from and that, you know, we, we engage with real farmers and, you know, it's, it's not made up in some lab somewhere. You know, we have real food. A lot of people don't think food companies are very honest about the source of their ingredients. Do you think Domino's wants you to know where their ingredients come from? Do you have the right to? Do you deserve to know what they're using? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we do want you to know. This is one of the parts where Domino's gets tomatoes for their sauce. This is Roger. He's a tomato man. He's not going to grab a fresh one. This is all natural, fine ripened tomatoes saw grown in California. Want to know where Domino's ingredients come from? We'll show you. See a source of our tomatoes and more at BehindThePizza.com. And get two mediums with two toppings for $5.99 each. Yeah, I the that was a really hard ad to pull off because you're out in the middle of nowhere, right? You're out in agricultural rural areas, but you have to get your consumers from a research facility out there. So we blacked out these windows on this limo and drove them out there. We did another one on a dairy farm as well. And, and we built this office to look like, you know, we basically pull in and they can't see outside. They go into the office building. They think it's an office building, then it opens up and they're sitting in the middle of a field. Uh, the one that was really tough was a dairy farm uh, because the cows started mooing. <laughs> and people are like, you know, what is going on? So for the year, um, sales were tremendous. We talked about a 14% sales increase in the first quarter. Um, you know, throughout the rest of the year in 2010, 9.9%. How we couldn't get to 10%, I don't know. I mean, somebody should have bought a couple of pizzas on the last day of the year um, and gotten us up to, uh, to 10%. I should have bought them myself. But, you know, tremendous turnaround when you take a look at, you know, kind of where we had been. And so then, you know, over, uh, over you know, kind of year on year, you can see where the competition was, flat to slightly down and we were absolutely all over it. So, you know, not only were we winning and making our customers happy and our sales were, uh, were growing, we were taking share uh, from our competitors. So, you know, we continued this. We said, hey, all right, we, you know, we've reinvented our pizza. What else can we reinvent? And by the way, I think some folks think that we had this master plan. It started here and we knew all along we we're gonna do all these things. We didn't. We did this thing, we caught lightning in a bottle and said, okay, now what? <laughs> now what are we gonna do? And we said, you know what? There are other things on our menu that could be better. Let's go fix those. So that's exactly what we did. My name's Tate. I am Domino's Chicken. Tate's got a lot of pressure on him. We have this box made to find out what people think about the new recipe. You see this? It's made with 100% white recipe. It's not a bunch of different chicken. It's all mashed together. Imagine if your boss had the entire country rate your performance on a box of chicken. I want to hear from you. That's the way you love this moment. So try to taste new chicken with a vegan two topping Domino's pizza. Choose only two for $5.99 each. You can tell us how he did it. I'm not excited about the box at all. <laughs> So I don't know if you can tell, Tate, Tate's not from around here. Uh, Tate's from Louisville, Kentucky. Tate worked at KFC. He was a you know, food scientist working for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I looked around, uh, and here's another one. When you want to make some transformational change, you have to understand if you have the right players. So I looked around at my kitchen staff, pizza expert, pizza expert, pizza expert. Who's the chicken expert? We didn't have one. We went out and hired Tate. He is the chicken man. We hired him from KFC. We put him in charge of our chicken. Um, and he did, has done a lot of really good work. Now, once we fixed the chicken, we needed to have something else for Tate to do. So uh, you'll see the next ad. We put together some new side items. Lately, we've been ordering a lot of cheesy bread from other places. And what we found, underachieving is rampant. If you look at this, a little bit of cheese with a whole lot of bread. We were one of the worst offenders. You know, what we said is, how do we make cheesy bread better? How do we make it special? Stuff it with cheese. 
Scott plus cheese is our medium pizza. I want to think we'll jump rope with their cheese. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> which I would recommend. Order any of our new stuff, cheese breads, or add to topping pizzas. Choose any two for just $5.99 each. <laughs> So anybody work in an agency or manage an ad agency, you know, there's creative tension. They show up with an idea. Hey, we want to do this. And then we say, oh, I don't know if we should do that. Maybe we should do it a little bit different. And sometimes it gets pretty contentious. Um, I'm convinced that the agency hates me. And, uh, that, you know, they're always trying to harass me. You see that weird spot where, like, Tate and I are just kind of standing there? That awkward, uh, you know, they had me dancing with a uh, walrus. Anybody ever see the walrus ad? That had a stove top and a beard. It looked like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I walked into the test kitchen, there's a giant mechanical walrus dressed up like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, right, I, I sent myself down for drug testing. I don't know what was going on. But sometimes the agency will harass you and uh, make you do silly things uh, when they put you on TV. So, you know, what do we continue to do? We continue to put up good numbers. We continue to increase the value of our company. Um, Bill talked a little bit about the stock price. You know, stock price was under $3 in 2008. I joined the company, by the way. My boss got fired four weeks later, and, you know, the stock fell to about, you know, under three bucks, and it looked like we were going to close 1,000 stores. <laughs> Hello, Hershey. Can I get my old job back? That'd be great. Right? Disaster. Um, now the stock's over 50. Market capitalization, for those of you who are not finance majors, market cap, right? Uh, shares outstanding times the share price. We were worth about $500 million at the time, the entire company. Today we're worth $2.5 billion. We created $2 billion in value um, for this company, and our franchisees are worth uh, an awful lot more. And this is their, their investment. So we're beating the pizza competition. That's great. One of the things that I would ask you to do, I used to work at Procter & Gamble. I worked on Sunny Delight. Anybody ever heard of Sunny Delight? Right, that's what you bought when you couldn't afford orange juice when you are in college, right? <laughs> right, Andrea? All right, that's how it goes. Um, I didn't really like working on Sunny Delight. It's kind of fake orange juice, and it's 5% juice, and a whole lot of other stuff. But uh, we used to define the category. Hey, we're the, share, we're the category leader. Oh, yeah? What category? Uh, less than 100% refrigerated juice drink. Really? That's how you're going to measure your share? And guess what? We were the only less than 100% refrigerated <laughs> juice drink. We have 100% share. We're geniuses. Okay, great. Try like all juice drinks or all beverages, right? All non-alcoholic beverages. Define your share in a way uh, that makes your share smaller, and then it creates a greater opportunity for you to go out and chase it. So, you know, we're definitely uh, competing with Pizza Hut and, and Papa John's, but, you know, we compete in the broader QSR marketplace. And when you're growing faster than, you know, McDonald's and Starbucks, you're doing something right. Things are going well for you. So we went from, you know, worst to first in taste, right, all the way from here, all the way uh, up to the top. And there's two things to taste. There's the actual taste. You can sit down in the lab and taste it. And then there's perception of taste. Okay, so well, if you put it in the box, if it says Domino's, does it bring your scores down? It used to. Believe that. We used to, if we did it branded, we would get a worse score than if we did it unbranded. It doesn't happen anymore. Now our scores go up when they see it's in a Domino's box. That's a win for us, for sure. And then we talked a little bit about uh, the value of the company, you know, going from you know, where we were to, uh, to where we are now. And these are our franchisees. So these, uh, you know, our franchisees are happy today. Um, Sales are good. They're, they're able to attract uh, really fantastic people, and we're very happy for them. So key messages overall. Debunk the self-limiting myths. Do it in your own personal life. Okay, oh, you know, I, I'm not good at math. I can't do it. Okay, you know, go, go focus on it. Go try to be the best at it. See what you can do. Find those. They exist all over. Listen to your critics. High return risks, okay? Don't focus on low return risks. The amount of risk we took on, on this bet was big. Okay, we managed it with the next point, which is research and analysis. But we went for something that if, we were, if it hit, it was going to pay off big, and obviously it has. Um, active management support, we talked a little bit about that. And be, being willing to sacrifice who you are for who you could become. Okay, that's the domino story. We've got uh, some time for questions. I, I know everybody has places to be, so I will take questions from the audience. Yes, sir.
You know, I think it happens slowly. And it happens so slowly you don't realize it. Um, one of the things I talk about, hey, listen to the critics. One of the th people I think you should listen to are new employees. Okay, because new employees come in and they say, hey, that's not very good. Oh, no, no, that's okay, that's, that's the way it is here. And I will tell you, after 18 months, they stop saying, hey, you know, what, what's wrong with this? Hey, this process is broken. Hey, this doesn't work. And they become indoctrinated and they start to accept whatever it is that the rest of the organization already believes. So if you get your newest employees in, they're valuable because they're looking at it you know, through a fresh set of eyes. You know, Domino's, I think it was over, uh, over a long period of time. You know, we've been number two in the United States in pizza for a long, long time. Um, pizza Hut is, is larger. And I think we started to accept our, our place as number two. And you know, hey, we're not those guys, we'll just be these guys. And you know, he, if you have an aspirational goal, you get the organization fired up to go and chase it. I think the risk for us right now, and we're actively managing this, is complacency now. And it's not even complacency, because we work hard, okay? We are, we are all after it right, you know, right now. It's not complacency as much as it is risk aversion, in, in my opinion, right? So I'm picking on the, the, you know, our poor one CFO in here. Um, here's a conversation going, that could, could happen when you have a lot of success. Hey, I know that you had to take a lot of risk to go fix the pizza, but things are different now. We don't need to take those kind of risks anymore because, you know, look, we're geniuses, right? We're all smart and, you know, everybody's making money and franchisees are happy and life is good. That's when you got to be really careful. I don't think it's complacency. We're going to stop working hard. That's not in our culture. That's not who we are. I think it's risk aversion. Well, things are good. Let's not screw it up. I think that's largely what happened, um, you know, to, to Domino's. We, we had some success. We had, you know, advertising was hit and miss. Um, you know, I think we had the wrong folks running, you know, running advertising. We had the wrong agency. We had a lot of things that weren't right. But, you know, just over time, we had come to accept that we weren't in the food business. We were in the service business. And that's the thing to ask yourself, what business are you in? And that's, you know, I don't know, it feels a little, you know, kind of Dale Carnegie, like, you know, hey, what business are you in? But you know what? Ask yourself that. You know, are we in the pizza business? Are we in the delivery business? Are we in the food business? What are we in? When you start to define, we're in the food business. I mean, service is great. You know, you go to a restaurant, they got really great service and terrible food, you're not going back. You got to do it both. You got to walk and chew gum. And I think we decided that we could do one thing well instead of trying to do everything well. Um, and over time, you know, that happens. And, and until you have somebody, you know, a crisis. So timing is everything in life, right? I've learned that. You know, I, I joined this company. If I had joined this company today, you know, am I, am I going to have the impact that, that I had? No. Domino's was in a spot where they needed, a lot, needed some help. But they're also willing to change. And you, are, you get willing to change when you go through failure. So things were tough. The economy was tough. Business was not good. All right, we'll do Solano's stupid idea. Let's see how it works. You know, what, what the hell? Um, but I think, you know, that's, you have to be willing and you have to have an impetus for change. And we had a lot of that. Yes, sir. You said you had a lot of resistance with uh, a lot of franchise uh, owners. Uh, so what was your strategy in terms of once you came up with a new recipe, rolling it out to the, let's say, into the United States? Did you do it, you know, in a test market, by region? How did you, how did you do that? That's a great question. Can you guys hear the questions in the back? Yes, sir. Yes? Jack, can you hear the questions back there? No, you can't hear them. Okay, so the question was, how do you know we got resistance from the franchisees? How do we roll this out? Was it a test market, or exactly what uh, what was it? A um, couple drawbacks of test market: one is they're expensive; two, they tip off of the competition what you're doing. You know, I don't think we could have gotten the, you know, kind of the explosion in the culture that we got if you know we had done it a little bit. So we were all in. We had n no test marketing. We had a lot of research, you know, a lot of, and, and I'm not talking about a focus group. I'm talking about, you know, sample size in the 500s, uh, statistically significant, laboratory settings, people trying, you know, different products, preference testing. Um, you know, when you're going to make a competitive claim like that, by the way, you know, that costs a lot of money and then you have to have it, you know, structured very carefully or you get sued. You know, if you run that test the wrong way and say, hey, look, we beat the competition, they will sue you. Um, you know, we did get cease and desist letters and we shared our data with the competition who wanted to see, hey, did you guys really beat us? We can't believe Domino's beat us. I love that. I thought that was great. Um, but, you know, how did we roll it out? We, you know, it, it was just a national rollout. We met with our franchisees, big regional meetings. You know, we had four. We're flying all around, meeting with them, and they show up and we say, here's a new pizza. Here's the strategy. Here's the research. By the way, it's going to cost you more. Um, you know, the new pizza costs about eight cents more per pizza, which is a pretty big expense. So that's another thing that's very different, right? Hey, how do I cheapen the food? How do I take money out of the food? 
you can try and make money that way. I don't think it's going to work. Um, you know, it depends on who you are and, and what your business is, but you have to have good food. Um, you know, we did a scrimp splurge model where, you know, we spent more money here and took some money out over here. Overall, it costs more, um, but overall, the product was, was dramatically different. So we just rolled it out. And I got to tell you, my boss, Russell Weiner, the most nervous guy in the world, okay? He's from the Bronx, and he's, you know, oh my God, I'm so nervous, this is gonna be a disaster. And I would tell him, come on, man, this is gonna be fine. You know, we're, you know we did our homework, we're smart, you know, cocky Solano. And uh, the day before it launched, I called him up in tears, oh my God, it's not gonna work, we're gonna get fired. And he said, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> So this, you know, it's funny because it feels like it was preordained to happen, like this was just going to happen. Of course it was going to happen. There were careers on the line. We didn't know that it was going to work. We thought it would. We obviously hoped that it would. Um, but, you know, you, you don't know until you do it. And we didn't test market it. Yeah, Dave. Brandon, you mentioned earlier, and I appreciate it, about the conversation about the ingredients. And there's an emerging consumer trend about it. where does it come from? But then there's other strains to that, such as as you and AR are very rapid, they got the local first. Mm -hmm. Is it locally produced? Is it genetically modified or non-GMO? Is it organic or non-organic? Talk about just how are you guys talking through this emerging consumer interest area? Uh, we're all over it. So, you know, things that are important to our consumers are important to us. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to avoid what we call greenwashing. You know, so like 4% uh, of one item is, you know, sourced locally. We don't want to do that. Um, you know, we, we've taken a look at this. Our supply chain is very complex, right? We've got 17 supply chain centers, 5,000 stores all over the United States. How do we get fresh food from here to every store, you know, a couple, two, three times a week, you know, on a regular basis? Uh, it, it's very difficult. Cost of ingredients. So, hey, I like organic. All right, cost 30% more. All right, I don't like it anymore. Okay, <laughs> there's that. Um, you know, our consumers willing to, to pay for that. Waste is a huge concern. So we have a whole wheat pizza crust that we, uh, we sell in schools. Um, USDA, uh, USDA requirements for, um, you know, a reimbursable meal, you know, have certain grain and, you know, salt and fat requirements. We have a pizza that meets that standard. One of the things I'm asked all the time by school administrators is, why don't you sell that in the regular stores? You know, people would, would be in for a whole wheat uh, a crust. And the answer is, in some places, they would be. Um, but if they're not, then our franchisees have waste. See, the, our business model is we collect 5.5% royalty from our franchisees on sales. If they make money, great. If they don't make money, they still pay us 5.5%. Okay? Now, if they don't make money, they're going to fail. They're going to go out of business long term. That's a, a bad place to be. So we're very concerned about store level profitability. And if they have to throw out food, one, wasting food just you know, feels bad, right? Mom said, eat everything on your plate. Um, so we work with this, but Dave, one of the things I'll tell you is we came out with a gluten-free crust. Okay? Now we couldn't call it gluten-free because there is gluten in the store, and, um, and I will tell you, anytime you're dealing with this area, you can take heat for being well-intended. We have a gluten-free crust. We're the first national chain to offer a gluten-free crust, and uh, you know, we took a lot of heat because it's, it's not gluten-free. I think we called it gluten-friendly. There's no gluten in the product, but there is gluten in the store, and we didn't want to say it was gluten-free and have somebody get hurt. So we called it gluten-friendly, and somebody said, I can't believe they don't have gluten-free. It's not true gluten-free. Well, to do that, we'd need a separate make line, which is $10,000, separate oven, <laughs> which is $50,000. We'd need to double the size of the store. And you know, right now, our gluten-free crust makes up you know, a handful of percentage of our sales. Um, so we couldn't do it all the way. And sometimes when you're talking about you know, organic or local, you know, people, want, people want us to be you know, the niche local pizza guy. And that's just not our business model. It's just not who we are. We're working on it. Um, you know, we're constantly kind of trying to stay on top of consumer trends and work and work for our business. We do it. So gluten-free, we're first. It's, it's small. It's not a big business, but you know what? It's important to a consumer segment. Uh, and uh, we don't have waste. It comes in frozen. And we take it out. And, and we don't have freezers in our stores. But uh, it, you know, we sell enough. We, we pack them in five. <laughs> so you get five cents to the store for the week. And you know, we might sell 10 a week. We don't sell a lot but they're not throwing it out. I was against gluten-free because guess what happens? And, and people say, hey, you know, put a low calorie thing on there and let's advertise that. That gets the guy who runs innovation fired, okay? Because people don't buy it and then you get fired. And Mrs. Solano does not want me to get fired, okay? <laughs> um, but the question is, well, what can we do? So when we, we do our website, 
we've got lighter options and you know we're helping consumers you know make smart choices but it's not a big ad campaign because that doesn't you know drive our business and we have a responsibility to our franchisees to make sure that we're driving their business so there's a 10 minute answer to your 30 second question <laughs> did i answer that question and the 10 others you didn't ask well it really addresses the tension between being uh, in a business where economy of scale is critical and you have these emerging customer markets that are very niche Right, and so that's the that's the the tension, and that's what we monitor. Is this going to get big? Is it niche? You know, and again, we don't want to greenwash. We don't want to say, hey, you know, we don't want to pretend that we buy local. Hey, we buy local. Yeah, you know, five percent of one ingredient. That, nah, you're kidding yourself, and you're. You know, I think you're deceiving consumers. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I will tell you, I think it's a devastating message to send to your team that you don't have to be better. And I'm not talking about your consumers, I'm talking about your staff, your employees. You know, can you imagine getting into the huddle, hey guys, you know, let's, we're going to try and be the same as everybody else, or maybe different, but not any better. Um, I don't want people on my team that don't want to be better than the other guy. Okay, I want people on my team who want to be better. And you know, when you say different, I guess it would be, the question would be different in what way? So different in a bad way? Bad. You know, different in a good way means better. So, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, can you give me an, an, an example of what you mean by different but not better? Well, you know, you, you look at different products like, um, like Crocs as an example, mm -hmm. you know, the shoes, right? They, they aren't better than anybody else. They just created a different product, something completely unusual. So I guess from a marketing standpoint, and you could have gone with different product lines. I mean, wings are getting big and, you know, that kind of stuff. You could have gone a completely different area, reinvented from a new product line rather than necessarily Right. Fashion, you know, I guess better is, you know, in the eye of the beholder, right? It's different. That makes it better. It's, you know, trendy. You can get into commodity businesses. I mean, I think the soda business is a good one, you know, Coke versus Pepsi. Personal preference, which one's better? You know, I don't know that, that there's a difference. I'd tell you those are really hard products to market, right? When your entire brand difference is based on your next ad, that's a scary place to be um, for, for me. And, you know, Coke's nostalgia. Pepsi's, you know, change and, you know, kind of future, and they've each kind of staked their claims. Um, for me, I spent, you know, time on innovation, new products, uh, all the way back. You know, Hershey, anybody ever heard of the Reese's Elvis Cup? I invented the Reese's Elvis Cup. Anybody know what Elvis's favorite food was? Peanut butter banana sandwich, very good. So I was running Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, and we found this technology that would allow us to put a layer of something else in there. We put marshmallow in and some other stuff. I said, hey, what if we put a layer of banana cream in there and then like signed a deal with Elvis's estate and they, <laughs> they wanted to be drug tested. We sold, <laughs> we sold $20 million with the Elvis cups in four weeks. It was the biggest one time limited edition promotion we'd ever had. Signed a deal with his estate, got to hang out in you know, Graceland and you know, it was completely crazy. And I know that's not the question you answered, but I love telling that story. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there's a school of thought that says, hey, you don't have to be better, you've got to be different. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of companies that have done well doing that. It's, it's not my personal point of view, which is, you know, be better, have a product point of difference. If you don't have a product point of difference, it's got to be fashion, your advertising, self-select, whatever else it is. I think if you have a product point of difference, um, it makes it so much easier. And it makes it true when you tell consumers, hey, we're better in this way. Now, one of the things that, that you didn't see is, you know, we had this ad that said, uh, <laughs> Got in trouble for this one. Hey, Papa John's, who's your daddy now? <laughs> okay. And what we found was that's not the voice that consumers wanted from us. That's cocky swagger. We're better in your face. And what worked was humility and listening and you know uh, that sort of thing. So we didn't do everything right either. We started to kind of lose our way. I got to tell you, we had a, uh, an ad. We had the Papa John's box, and it says better ingredients, better pizza. And the agency ripped off better and better, and it said ingredients, pizza. And I wanted to run that as an ad, but the lawyers wouldn't let me. So, all right, other questions? Yes, sir. How do you um, motivate within the organization to keep them pushing forward to make your product better and advertise it like that? So, so, I 
I think so much of it's about uh, what happens to them, um, what happens to them if they fail. So let me tell you this, if you fail and you get fired or you, know, you get dragged out by security and they throw you on the front steps of the building and say, hey, you're out of here, nobody will ever do that again. Okay. Um, part of it is culturally, do you reward that? Do you recognize it? Do you give people a repi award for doing it? So recognition, and then what happens on the backside of it? Now, if, if you fail, um, you know, and, and not everything that uh, we've invented has, has been gangbusters. We didn't have any like, you know, dramatic failures. You know, we launched pasta, doing okay. You know, it's not the huge hit that some of the other things are. But if you do something and it doesn't work, what does your company do about that? Okay, if, you're, if it's very punitive, people will stop innovating. They'll stop pushing because what they'll, they'll find out, people are smart. Hey, if I just sit here and you know, nobody moves, nobody gets hurt, I'm just not gonna move. I'll just sit here. And then you stop innovating. So you know, reward and recognition. Now if somebody is a, has, you know, they're a, serial, they're a serial failure, they fail, they fail, they fail, you know, next. I mean, you gotta, you gotta get rid of that person and have somebody else there. But if you have uh, you know, your organization set up that encourages smart risk taking, I think you'll be fine. And you gotta hire the right people. I mean, that's, that's critical. That's why Andrew's coming to join us, and so is Jack. He just doesn't know it yet. All right. Other questions? Yes, sir. As you were pushing to reinvent the product, and you showed that sales spike, the first thing that popped in my head is, did I slip on the delivery side? Did I slip on the service side and lose my way there? Hell yes, we did. We were terrible. It was a disaster. If you ordered a pizza you know, on Super Bowl Sunday, you, you might have gotten it Tuesday. It was crazy. <laughs> Um, you know, when we had to hire, we hired like 25,000 uh, more people, more drivers. Um, we're building more stores now because some of the stores are so busy they can't support the volume. So, you know, the answer is we did. And, you know, I, I tell you what, I got counseled. I had to present to the board. And, you know, I'm like, hey, this is going to be awesome. We're going to sell a ton of pizza and, you know, it's going to be great. And they said, you know, lower expectations. You're scaring the board, you know. Okay, so this thing, uh, you know, people will try it, and over time, maybe our business will be a little bit better. So we managed expectations, and then the thing, you know, went hit like a freight train, and we ran out of food, and service was a disaster, um, and we lost some cu some customers. We disappointed some people, and that really bums us out. Um, but we fixed it. You know, our operations team are top notch. You know, we hired people, we trained people, and you know, we got our act back together. But yeah, we were absolutely unprepared for that. I mean, we we're running out of dough. Uh, you know, we deliver to our, to our franchisees, right, so they get their, their food on a big Domino's truck. But if you run out of something, you can go to your local distribution center and pick something up. We had, like, guys renting U-Hauls because their deliveries weren't coming for two more days, picking up food at that time. I mean, it's just, we were, we had no idea it was going to be that big. And if we had told people it was going to be that big, nobody would have believed us and they would have told us to manage expectations. So, how are we doing, Tom? Is it, is it time? Okay. All right. Thank you. One more question. Yes, sir. How did you guys compare to uh, like the journal or uh, like how did you guys, did you guys take into consideration to buy it at the store and make it at home? You know what? Uh, I get asked that occasionally. We, we really don't pay much attention to those guys. And, you know, maybe that's something that we, we should. Like, hey, that's a risk. Um, I know they like to compete with us and try to be a substitute for us. Um, you know, at some level, you compete for food, right? McDonald's, Subway, you know, kind of everybody else. I guess we kind of view them like any other grocery store meal. So you could go you know, buy something else out of the freezer case, not pizza, uh, at your local grocer. We kind of view it more as a, a home meal, not really a substitute for what we do. It's still pizza, but it's a very different consumer occasion um, versus you know, kind, of, kind of getting Domino's. You know, their quality has gotten better. Uh, I know they, they, you know they like to say, hey, they're you know, kind of as good as we are. Uh, we know that that's not the case. Thank you all for coming, but I have two really quick stories to, to share. I know uh, the ambassador uh, wishes he was here. And the reason being is I, some months ago, I told him that uh, I met uh, Patrick Doyle from Domino's and uh, that uh, there was a connection uh, with you as a VP. And then he started uh, talking that my, my granddaughter went online so that she can pick the crust and she can pick the topping and she can do this, this, and this. And she said, that, that, was, that was great, that was remarkable. And, and the pizza was pretty good. That's from the ambassador. That's awesome. Yeah. And he's Italian. And he's an Italian, too. <laughs> but you know, anything, when you, when you hear from Ambassador Secchi, it's pretty good, you know it's good. <laughs> it's good.
all right? But he went on. Then he said, we got to get this guy as part of this breakfast series. That was, you know, that was, uh, in, in a way, how this happened. Remember that, uh, Ronnie? So, but uh, from the ambassador, that's a, a pretty good compliment. Uh, his granddaughter can, you know, pick and choose, and then it's pretty good. So she let him know we appreciate his business. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is uh, kind of a fun personal story too. Uh, the Saturday before uh, Easter, uh, I had uh, uh, some family and extended family, uh, which included then five adults and five kids, all under the age of eight. Okay, so eight, six, uh, eight and eight, six and six and a two and a half year old, uh, four girls and a boy. We had your hands full. Okay, it was great. So what are we gonna do for dinner on the evening before Easter? Well, dominoes. Okay, right on wealthy. So everyone said, yeah, this, is, this sounds great. So we got the dominoes, got the, some uh, drinks, and so I called over there and I said, uh, uh, well, what, what kind of pizza, pizza? And everyone said, cheese, you know, all the kids. Went. So I said, I need three large cheese pizzas, two, and then he said, well, what kind? I said, well, hand tossed and the Brooklyn style. Oh, yeah. Okay. Look at this. He's like, he's deep. He's okay. into it, isn't he? So, the Brooklyn style. So, but no, this is, this is all true. There's not, no hyperbole on this at all. Okay. So I go on over, and uh, it's right uh, where I live at 801 Plymouth. It's real close to the Wealthy Street uh, pizza. Uh, so I go on in there, and um, I said, uh, well, I got the kids who wanted to eat one, one of these pizzas. I just know that. So I said, could you cut them in child or kid-sized pizzas in the slices? And I said, hmm, well, it's already out. But sure. So they pull it out of the box, put it on, and then they made kid-sized slices. You know how we, if you have youngsters, you have to cut it yourself? Sometimes it's a real pain because I don't have the right tools. So they'd slice them up and put it all back in and brought it home. And since I had just three cheese pizzas, they rang it up and they said, oh, you get a discount too. Because I don't get any of the toppings, I guess. Okay, so for $24.95, I fed 10 people. <laughs> Domino's pizza. Awesome. The Saturday night before. And so what we had is it was kind of chilly. We haven't had spring yet. So we had a picnic pizza on the floor <laughs> with the kids with their sliced pizza. And they were loving life. Mm -hmm. You know, the little boy, three, two and a half years, I had four pieces. <laughs> he reports to his mom. Okay. So after all this, we had only one slice left over. Okay. And so I, I, I just had to tell a story because I'm, I knew that you were coming, and I, I see this, and the pizza for the kids was all gone. That's awesome. Okay, but they did. The, the folks there at the at the franchise were, were super, but they had the child size pizza, and they had slices, and they picked it up. And, you know. Well, you remember when you were a kid, right? Long time ago for some of us, and you're in school, and they would say, "We're having a pizza party." You would lose your mind, right? <laughs> that was like the greatest thing that ever happened. Sure. And you know, that's a lot of fun of, uh, of working in a pizza company. Walking every day, it's fun. Jack, you don't want to work in a bank, okay? You want to come work in a pizza company. It's a fun time, okay? It's a good time. It is, it is. So, but these, you know, so they, it was fun to have a pizza picnic uh, the uh, night before for Easter. And I have had an invitation to go to Ann Arbor to help because uh, many, many, many years ago, when I was in New York, and I am a pizza guy from New York, I can even use my accent if you barely want to hear it, but I could throw the pizza up in the air and, and uh, do all that when I was a 17-year-old working in a short order cook, making pizza. So I already know I have an invitation. I'm going to take advantage of it and uh, check out the, the pizza over in Ann Arbor. But uh, I just uh, need to share those two stories, and I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, Brandon, that uh, you're a, a Laker for a lifetime, without a doubt, and the uh, connections that you have with, with our students, with our university. And he has uh, now some, uh, uh, the next generation uh, in uh, his family are going to be Lakers uh, too this coming fall. So the legacy uh, of Salento continues uh, here and uh, I'm thrilled that you could share. But I'm wondering, when are you going to do breakfast pizza? I thought we'd have something out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, it's under development. I can't tell you what's under development. Oh, very good. <laughs> well, let's give him a hand again. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Everyone have a uh, great day into the semester. As we know, it uh, gets uh, hectic and busy, but uh, two, less than two weeks, so uh, we're going to uh, graduate a whole bunch of folks and uh, pretty exciting uh, times for us. So let's uh, uh, end it with a crescendo and uh, get ready for summer and next year, too. So thank you.